So I, I just want to thank Chris because I'm going to take this with me on my world travels and put him in very compromising positions and take photographs. So I would suggest you do the same. And it's, I think it's C3 Crota, right? You can find him on Twitter. It's a good way to go. So look, I, I just have about 20 minutes. I'm going to try to move through a few things and, and maybe take some questions at the end. I have use cases, right? This is built as a case study. What I really want to talk at the start of this is about what I see happening as driving the space, uh, how we've applied this. So a week ago at this time, I was the Vice President of Manufacturing Industries for GE Digital, started as the CIO of Advanced Manufacturing a couple years prior to that, and, uh, and as of Monday, uh, took the role of COO, a uh, new role at Vuzix, uh, because I, I, think, I think if you're not started, you're behind already. I mean, if you're not trying these things. So I'll try to give you some things to think about. I'm gonna show you some of the use cases that we did. And rather than kind of take you down a path uh, that we've talked about, I actually do have the upskill video in here that Chris showed. I'm gonna give you some other things to think about how that impacts the space. Uh, just a safe harbor statement to remind you that nothing I say is actually uh, true. Um, think, of, think of machine learning, think of the big brain, right? And what's up in the cloud. So this to me was a great example very simple way to understand machine learning. This is the game Breakout. Anybody play this game as a kid? Anybody old enough to remember this? I was calling it Pong and somebody corrected me, it's Breakout. And what they did is they just teach the computer to listen and learn, keep the paddle under the ball, keep the score going up. Instead of writing all of the code that tells you exactly how to play the game, amazingly after two hours, the machine figured out how to play as well as I've ever played. And within four hours, figured out the real goal of the game is to figure out how to drill that little channel up the side so that the ball rattles around in the top by itself. This is the stuff that used to happen. You'd have to go to MIT or some huge school to get access to that type of computing power that now, uh, I haven't done it myself, but I'm pretty sure you can just go on your iPhone and spin up some uh, web service out of the big guys that have this stuff in the cloud with a credit card in about five minutes. You have access to this that you've never had before. And this is going to change how we do things in ways that I don't think people understand. But it's tough to get there and get all the data there. So let's just park that for a second. Let's understand that there's this huge brain, we can access it, it can drive the process. Let me talk about another topic that's driving it. Uh, who? Who's been to a presentation where Uber was used as an example of disruption? I should say, who has not? There was a thing on LinkedIn that said, that's awful, stop talking about Uber. I, I don't have any hobbies. I think about this stuff way too much. I don't think it's about having a company that doesn't have assets. There's, for centuries, there have been companies that didn't have assets. That's not what they do. What they do is they're a data supply chain company. So what they've done is digitally transform the process. In just a few clicks, fire the app. I bring this up, this, I took these screenshots when I was out at San Ramon at GE Digital's headquarters. And you know there it is, it already knows the last couple places I've been. The big brain says, hey, you may be going back to where you were yesterday about this time. With one click I can decide, I can get decimal precision on a set of assets to help me drive and get there. Uh, this is interesting because the system's smart enough to know that it's not actually that smart, right? It hasn't been able to fix my position because of how the GPS works in that area to the restaurant or the hotel. So it allows me to either do that myself or leave it open and what happens then? The driver calls you and says, are you at the hotel, are you at the, the restaurant? So it's smart enough to know when it's not smart and by the fifth click, I know who they are, what they are, where they are, it's on their way to me. That's a digital transformation of a process that others think putting up a web page does the same thing. They, they are two foundationally different things. What you see on the right of that slide is a digitization of a process. It is figuring out how to hammer an anvil faster, how to weave a buggy whip faster if my laptop's connected to the network, and if the location services are turned on, and if the proxy in the hotel passes that, 
maybe I can figure out how to use that website to get my, well, you know what? Skip it. I'll just go to the Uber app. They didn't come into a space, and, and I titled this Amateurs versus Experts. They were not expert taxi drivers, right? The car rental company thinks the game-changing way to approach me is that instead of walking off the bus and looking up at the board and seeing I'm in slot 972, I walk off the bus, I look at my phone, and it says I'm in slot 972. If they really wanted to disrupt the process, when I turn my phone on, because I would do this, it would ping their box, it would say, he just landed, put the driver in the car, meet him at this because I've actually given him access to my American Airlines app. I would hop in that car, I'd be on my way, and when I came back to the airport, they would know based on proximity, they would meet me there, I'd drop the car, I'm done. Here's what happens, that rental car is one third of the price of taking an Uber between the airport and San Ramon. But I take the Uber because it saves me hours, literally. Do not mistake digital transformation or digitization for digital transformation. They are two different things. These processes and the risk associated with what you're doing with wearables are putting lipstick on the pig giving somebody something up here that was here. Now, that doesn't mean that didn't create value for the Taxi Association in San Ramon. It just means you should not kid yourself as to the respect of how it's gonna impact the process. So I beat that horse. Here's another topic to think about. Andy McAfee did a great session at, the, uh, at Minds and Machines a couple of years ago. Two things he said that stuck with me. One, talked about uh, second half of the chessboard. They looked at the emergence of the internet and uh, Moore's Law, and they figured around 2006, 2007, we got to the second half of the chessboard. The analogy is that we're in this exponential growth in the capability of technology. We're at a spot today. What are the science fiction shows on TV? A Western? Science fiction has lost its ability to push us in our thinking. We are actually delivering things as fast as science fiction is. So number one, it's exponentially changing. If you sit for a year waiting for the next variant of that device or the next incarnation, you are not one year behind, you're probably five years behind. Second piece he talked about was they did a survey of experts versus algorithms. And you can do the math here. Experts are right about 54% of the time, the algorithm's right about 94% of the time. Is anybody here surprised by that? Did anybody here not realize that a data-driven organization is far more effective than people taking wild guests at a whiteboard at 5 a.m. and on Monday morning? Anybody? Nobody's gonna raise their hand because now you're gonna be embarrassed. Well, that doesn't explain the fact that for the last couple decades, our performance is pitiful. This is industrial performance, year-over-year -year productivity gains. It's gone from 4%, actually it's about zero now. So we're putting technology in faster, we're more data-driven than we ever were, and we are performing more poorly. We're, we're not even delivering what we did decades ago. My theory is it's because we've digitized and not transformed. We've put in one more system. Now look, don't mistake what I'm saying. It is a valuable thing sometimes to do the right thing the wrong way. To go out and test something in the field, turn it on, and not have it fully integrated into the back end because I'm trying to prove the, the group that was up here talked about get people's buy-in, help them understand it. That's a good thing to do, but don't kid yourself and say, I'm gonna go and buy a wearable solution. That's the same as saying, I'm gonna go buy a barcode system. I don't know what a barcode system is. A barcode is just a device you can read, right? So we have got to change how we drive this. And, and I'll show you the examples and how they manif manifest themselves, but here's the heart of the problem. So it's not a technology problem, it's a leadership problem and a change management problem. As you move to the edge, 
what you're really doing is you're getting better performance and loss of control for management. When the CEO of the company can talk directly to the CEO of the manufacturing line through an eyepiece based on data, there are thousands of people who no longer have a job or a role if that role or job is specifically based upon how you shuttle, move, collect, reprint, re-enter data, right? Digitization is not a digital transformation. This is what makes everybody nervous. What happens when, if people get all of this data in real time? We have these conversations about salaries, we have these conversations about you know, transparency in business, and in the manufacturing and industrial sectors, this is what petrifies people, in my opinion. So doing these first outings is gonna change people's view on this and understand that if we have a well-functioning organization with generally good people, which in my belief, 85% of the team wants to move ahead, 15% might be dragging you down. Of the 15%, it's really just a small percentage that are working against you. They'll move along when they realize that the data is exposing people who are not moving the business process forward. And that gets kind of delivered in this concept of a digital thread, right? GE Digital and GE likes to talk about the digital twin and the thread really connecting from the concept all the way out through the field in real time. You can read it. It's public data. I'm not sharing anything that's not public data, but GE uh, harvested 730 plus million dollars of cost and opportunity last year by taking this approach and saying if we connect across, if we digitally transform. So the, the win is there. Make no doubt about it. I talk about, a lot of people talk about ITOT. Anybody here ETMTFT? Engineering technology, manufacturing technology, field technology. If you think IT and OT don't talk, put the ETMTFT people in a room, they don't even know they had that part of a business. And creating that thread, again, goes back to pushing that capability to the edge. So the specific use cases that we've delivered, there's some great video on YouTube at Minds and Machines, so I can't stop the video. Make a mental snapshot of what you just saw. The guy holding the iPad, looking at their work, right? I don't know if they use their nose to do the work or their bite on, right? If you're holding something like this, it doesn't matter how incredibly augmented the space is, it's not going to help you do the job if your job is to work with these, right? The value of this story is really about how all of that rich context, data, information, engineering, all come together into one place to be consumed effectively. And this is how we hold things up because an operations person will say two things. Number one, I need these to work. So you need to give me something that's more suited for the worker. I don't get that. I don't understand that. The second thing they'll say, most people will say, I've heard them myself say this, is that's Star Wars. We are so far away from being able to do that kind of stuff until my buddy Joe sends me a cell phone video from taking his family to Disney. I mean, I know we don't do it for a $450,000 piece of equipment in the field yet, but we do it for a $16.99 toy at the Disney store. Again, it's not a technology problem. It's a use case that drives the transformation that gets built out very quickly so people understand how that vision of transformation gets executed at the front line. Now, careful. I'm going to show you a video here. It's just a minute. I'm not showing it to disparage anybody. It's very funny. It might not be terribly complimentary to these folks, but as people flood into a space, my background's manufacturing and operations. I started two weeks out of high school, got, a, got on a Martz bus out of Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania, went to my co-op at GM in Tarrytown. That's what I do. I understand operations, industry top to bottom. I like the tech stuff, I understand the operations. But as people say, I know AR, I know wearables, I know technology, I'm gonna come in and help you. Here's what could potentially happen when a technological expert 
meets with a practical application. So if we could roll this video here. We are the premier engineering and science institution in the world. Do you think you could light a bulb with a battery and wire? Do you think you could light a bulb with a battery and wire? Yeah. Light a bulb with a battery and a wire. Maybe. Yes. Definitely. Do you think you can light a bulb with a battery and a wire? Battery and wire? Well, yes, why not? Okay. Definitely. Okay, can you do that? The interesting part about the batteries and bulbs question is that people always predict that they can do it. Students say, of course I can do this. And, uh, any hints I should have here? Teachers say, of course my students can do this. Oh! Do you know why that didn't work? I have no idea. Who's an engineer in here? Is that frightening or not? You could guess what school that is. I mean, these are brilliant people. They're not knowledgeable in the space. They don't have a practical knowledge, right? We have got to be careful that we don't end up going down the path of the battery and the bulb and saying, hey, look, I, I know it. It can't be that hard, right? Why can't you put your head in a bucket and lower you by straps into a tank with all this electronic gear. Well, it might be an explosive environment. That's not a good thing. We need to know that first. So consider how you do these things, but use the discussion and the process. So in GE Transportation, we did a bunch of projects when I was there. If you look in the small panel to the upper right, there's some green and some blue. Because, and this is going back to the big brain, this is going back to connecting all the data, to transforming the process, they were able to say, take a system that existed in space, connect it with data that had existed in a different group that those two people probably never met each other, and use it to create an outcome that is foundationally different than what we had. They spent a few hundred thousand dollars and they harvested millions and tens of millions of dollars by saying what? By saying this device that comes back to be serviced has a recipe for service. I do it the same way every time. What if instead of doing it the same way every time, I actually listened to the data in the field that said, here's how it performed, here are the parts and pieces you should service on here. That one, don't even clean it, don't check it, don't refurb it, throw it away because it's 15% past its life. Use data from different sources. When you bring that data up into an eyepiece, you end up with what Chris showed around this upscale video, right? So, Anybody want to take a guess at the question and the first yeah, but I hear when we show this? Yeah, but after the fifth time of doing that job, does that operator really go back to the workbook every time? They don't have to do that. If he does that five days a week, 52 weeks a year, that's, he's not going to get 30%. Let's go back to transformation. What do companies want to do? Companies want to deliver personalization to each customer. What happens when you have personalization? There's a whole army behind this that says on page 46, line 22 of that book, there is a different plug that has to be used on that patch panel that we miss because when we do the same thing five days a week, 52 weeks a year, we just miss that. And then we put it out in the field and how do we fix that? The FT team that doesn't talk to the MT team or the ET team? finds out that they have to send someone out there because during the installation, they're trying to plug a jack into a panel, a, a port that doesn't exist. I can make every one of those panels different. And if you think 34% is a big gain in performance, you have no understanding of the gain that comes when you instrument and digitize, transform that entire chain of data. Go back to the Uber example Uber, so I just remember this the other day. Uber does cars. They do food. Uh, a year and a half ago, I was sitting in my office in Michigan. My phone chirped and it said, would you like the Christmas carolers from the University of Michigan to come to your site and sing Christmas carols? So they do Christmas carols. Imagine that business plan. Mr. CEO, I have a plan 
for new business. It's going to do cars, food, Christmas carols. If you look up, they got a lot of heat, and I'm not diminishing the issues they're having. They got a lot of heat because there was a, I think it was a bank robbery. And if you read the story, everybody was trying to get out of an area because there was physical danger. So everybody hits Uber. They got dinged because they did surge pricing and people had to pay extra to get a car out of a dangerous area. I'm going, you guys can't see the forest for the trees. They showed up before the first responders got there. And by the way, they really, the response in my opinion, I shouldn't say this, it's being recorded. The response in my opinion should have been, so you want me to come and pick you up from a dangerous situation, but you don't want to throw the extra 20 bucks on the bill. And you want to stand there and go, I don't know if it's worth 20 bucks. The guy's shooting. Should I pay the extra? Right? Everybody got so fixated on that noise. What they missed is that this business model, this data supply chain, this transformed model, actually delivered first responders to an area on demand before an entire set of infrastructure could do that. Think about how that changes a business. When you start to talk about these use cases in the warehouse, it's not just about the warehouse, it's about the eject button that Chris talked about. It's about inventory accuracy, right? When we talk about use cases like Airbus, it's about delivering new engineering data to an operator. It manifests itself in a 500% improvement in productivity because this particular task is being done completely differently. But imagine now, every aircraft could be individually configured right now by a salesperson with a buyer who says that's actually on the chain out in the plant, we can actually make those changes live real time. What is that worth to a business as compared to saying, I'm not sure how long it's gonna take or our system doesn't allow that, right? So think in terms of what happens when this collision of I can now hook to the people and the machines incredibly quickly and effectively. I can digitize every transaction in between and use the big brain. I use that infrastructure to transform my business model. Buffett was on Squawk Box or something the other morning, and he was talking about how Amazon really grew. One of the comments he made was they could harvest the value of infrastructure they didn't have to build by driving a different business model. You have the engineering system, you have the sales system, you have the manufacturing execution system, you have people putting things in, doing things in the field. You need to figure out how to test these things quickly. We as providers need to figure out how to make it easier to turn them on. And then you deliver the big gains. And if you wanna see an organization move, you do this in two or three different spots, you expose it to the rest of the team, and the 85% says, we gotta do this, we gotta move. We gotta get past the impediments. I think if you start with the vision, where is it that we're gonna go? I, no, this became incredibly clear to me in my time at GE. No endless stream of random acts of brilliant, brilliance will coalesce into a strategy. Doesn't happen. You need to understand where you're gonna go. As, and I'm not saying two years of definition and all kinds of, you know, terabytes of data on what we're doing to transform. We are going to be more effective in how we deliver this to our customers and it will change our business this way. Underneath that is the value. How do we actually expose this? Where are the pillars in engineering, in manufacturing, in the field, whatever it is that we're doing? Now underneath that are the tactics. And if you take this approach, because this is what will happen next, you'll show up somewhere with one of these and an operator at a patch panel and, they, and someone will say, I can do that with Excel on my iPhone. We make the same thing every time, so that 30% isn't valid for me. Yet, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a tactic that exposes and confirms the value that delivers on a vision that moves the whole process forward. So regardless of where you land on these topics, if you think this is an opportunity to transform the organization digitally, don't make the mistake of simply digitizing. Don't make the mistake of just kind of casting the, the, the seed out there and saying, hey, this thing will sprout up into a crop. It needs to be nurtured by leadership like the folks you saw here earlier with partners like Chris and, and Brian and the folks at Upskill and all the other great partners that are out there to say, how do we move this forward quickly? 
So I wanted to share those thoughts with you. I hope that was helpful. These case studies and more data on these are available. If you've got some, uh, some questions, uh, I think we have time for maybe a question or two. No, nope. yeah, one, one. one question. <laughs> Who's got one question? Ra wave your cr Chris around if you got a question. We got a young man up here. Yeah, hi, Cal from Practic. Thank you so much for your time. So um, you mentioned the actual operation, but you don't mention the business model a lot. The biggest problem with uh, you know, wearable technology is depreciation later down in time and the knowledge transfer. The more they learn, the less they rely on it. So could you expand on different business models like hardware as a service? Data collection is very prominent when it comes to this, and it's coupled with SaaS companies. Is there a possibility that we can actually weigh that benefit, their ROI, and have it as hardware as a service? So full-time equivalent equals this much higher. Oh, yeah. So, okay. So as a service model, so the as a service model, uh, most people like to talk about it as computer, computing power, servers, hardware, whatever. The, the, and again, this is public information. I'm not sharing anything that's not public. GE uh, did some work with uh, one of the oil and gas companies to do uh, clamping pressure as a service, a blow-off preventer. So everybody knows a blow-off preventer from the Deepwater Horizon. If it doesn't work right, it's got catastrophic consequences. And r nobody wants a blow-off preventer. They want the clamping pressure. Everybody looks at this as a service. The, the challenge is if the, if the management doesn't understand digital transformation, they're gonna struggle with how do we set the benchmark? How do we work against that benchmark? However, that's the way you wanna go. Because I don't really want this device. I mean, I want this device, I'm COO of the company now, but what I really want is I want people to get a better, quicker outcome, better, faster, cheaper, all at once. And then the next time I cycle through this, we're not gonna have an argument of, hey, should I wait a year? Because if I turn it on today, if I put it in place tomorrow and it's paid for itself by the end of next week, we're good. Pitch it and buy the next one. Who's got an iPhone 7? Anybody? Who had an iPhone 6 and got rid of it or an iPhone 5 to, to use it? What was wrong with the iPhone 5? Nothing. Makes calls, does email, does text, right? We, if we focus on the device, we get stuck in that why do I have to refresh this device? If we focus on the outcome, then I can go back and I can say, look, we got you 34%. Now with this new capability of the device, we're gonna be able to get you another 10% tranche on top of that or another 30%, or we're gonna give them a 20, you know, an eight hour wear instead of a three hour wear all day. That, we really have to be thinking about that. You're gonna stretch people's imaginations with that. So look, we're out of time. Thanks very much. I hope, hope this was helpful, and I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to share some ideas with you. Thanks. <laughs>